Thank you for listening, downloading, sharing, subscribing, commenting, donating, and praying for us. And for going to brotherlance.com to get the free PDF of this teaching. Brotherlance.com Getting to Know God, Part 8, God of All Comfort. God comforts those who suffer. So our focus verse is 2 Thessalonians 2, 16-17. Now our Lord Jesus Christ himself and God our Father who loved us and gave us eternal comfort and good hope through grace, comfort your hearts and establish you in every good work and word. Right? So it says life is hard. It could be a long, exhausting struggle that beats us down every day. We can lose our joy and corrupt our own peace. And our study today, getting to know God, God of all comfort, I hope to help us reset our mindset. We will focus our thoughts on how God is actively trying in various seen and unseen, known and unknown ways to comfort our souls. It is his very nature to care for his creation and to bring peace you know and you know a lot of people going through a lot of things our loved ones are going through things we're going through things people we care about and sometimes we feel helpless in those things and we don't know what to do about it you know but we have to understand that God is big you know and he's in control Dear Heavenly Father, we praise you. We thank you so much for loving us. Thank you for being the God of comfort, Father. Life's hard. It's tough at times. We have ups and downs, and life can be confusing, and there can be so many problems. It can be overwhelming, Father. So that's what we're learning about today, that you, how you are the God of all comfort. So just send us your Holy Spirit, guide us your truth, help us understand, apply it to hearts and minds, Father. Please bless every one of our prayer requests we talk today, and everything that's on our heart, spoken and unspoken prayer requests, Father. We just seek you. We seek your help, and you know that you're faithful, that you'll see us through this life and that you'll never leave us. So we praise you. We thank you for that and for loving us. And bless those who are not able to uh, be with here, us here today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. So we're going to kind of reset our minds here. It says, the Father God we are dealing with. Let's see what Romans 8, 31, 32 says. So Romans 8, 31 through 32. What then shall we say about these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He, this is the kicker, he who didn't spare his own son, but delivered him up for us all. How would he not also with him freely give us all things? So if we want to understand what kind of Father God we're dealing with today. And in all of our problems and all of our struggles, he did not even spare Jesus. Right? But delivered him up for us all. That's how far God is willing to go. Right. And sometimes we can lose sight of that because our problems seem so big. Right. And the, and the mountain seems so high. And, you know, we don't know how to get over it, around it, under it or through it. But we need to look back. And we need, need to reset our minds that like, listen, God put in every effort to be with us. Right. And that effort hasn't ended. OK. To understand our father, God, we just have to look at Jesus. John 14, 9. Jesus said to him, I have I been with you such a long time and do you not know me, Philip? He who has seen me has seen the father. How do you say show us the father? So if we want to know the personality of our father, God, all we have to do is look at Jesus. Mm -hmm. Right. And so he's the perfect physical example. Like we often like, oh, I wish I could touch God, see God, talk to God, hear God, you know, all these physical things. Well, God knew that we're this way. So he sent us his son. Right. And so he's like, listen, if you want to know me, know my son. He does everything like I do. Okay. So John 10, 9 through 18. I am the door. If anyone enters in by me, he will be saved and will go in and, uh, and go out and will find pasture. The thief only comes to steal, kill and destroy. I came that they may have life. God is a life giver and may have it abundantly. God is an abundant life getter, giver. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep, right? We just read in Romans 8 where Jesus, uh, God did not even spare his own son, right? And so Jesus says, listen, I am willing to die for you. He who is a hired hand and not a shepherd who doesn't own the sheep sees the wolf coming and leaves the sheep and flees. The wolf snatches the sheep and scatters them. The hired hand flees because he is a hired hand and doesn't care for the sheep. I, I am the good shepherd. I know my own and I am known by my own. Even as the father knows me, I know the father. I lay down my life for the sheep. 
I have other sheep which are not of this fold. I must bring them also, and they will hear my voice. They will become one flock with one shepherd. Therefore, the Father loves me, because I lay down my life that I may take it up again. No one takes it away from me, but I lay it down by myself. I have power to lay it down. I have power to take it again. I receive this commandment from my Father. So if we look at this, uh, God, God says, like, if you want to see who I am, look at my son. And Jesus is like, listen, I will die for you. I have died for you, right? And so what we need to like, when we're looking at life and all the stuff that we're going through, we need to understand who we're dealing with. We could feel so far and so distant. God, where are you? You know, why aren't you fixing this problem? Why haven't you made this better? Right. And, but in reality, what's really going on is like, listen, my starting line was death. And everything after that should have you convinced that I am working on your behalf. I am trying to make it right. But we, the problem we have to understand, like we in our, our, our ministry, right? We suffer as a ministry because God wants people to partner with us, help us and give and, and be a part of our lives. But he also has grace for those people. And so he, like for us, we have to always remind ourselves, God is working on people's hearts and minds. He's doing stuff in their life. In the same grace he's given us to get our lives right, he's waiting for other people to get their lives right. You know, so we can't have bitterness in our heart when we struggle and we know people can help us and they don't. We have to pray for them because at the same time, we needed that same type of grace. We needed that same type of mercy, right? But see, you have to understand in your life, God is doing that with everyone around you, everyone you're dealing with, everybody that you think is ignoring you, not partaking, not participating, or just taking from you all the time and never giving back to you, you know? And so what you have to understand is God is working in their lives with grace and mercy, mm -hmm. you know? And so far, we just want God to come in a lightning bolt and make everything right, but he never did it to us. So why are we wanting him to do it to other people? So what do we do? We have to be patient. We have to understand that God is working all things out. We might have loved ones, family members that are sick, people that are hurting. Like I, I have that in my life. I think all of us do, you know, and we pray for them every single day. Father God, heal them, heal them, pray that, bless them, be with them, keep them, you know, but at the same time, he's working in their lives. It's not that God doesn't understand or hear our prayers or doesn't understand our concerns, but God is taking a 50,000 foot view while we're taking a one inch view. We're so close to the problems. We can't see the whole picture, right? But God is up here going, yes, I hear your prayers. Keep praying. They matter, but in due time, in due season, right? And so if we can look at God and it's like, God did not spare his son. Jesus is an example of God. Jesus died for us. We know that all these other things aren't too big for God. He's willing. We just have to tell her he's willing, but in his time. Okay. So top of page two, John 10, 27 through 30, my sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me. I give eternal life to them. They will never perish and no one will snatch them out of my hand. Right? So that's our foundation with our, our God and our Lord is that he gives us eternal life. We are in the palm of his hand and nobody could take us out of that hand. Okay. My father who has given them to me is greater than all. No one is able to snatch them out of my father's hand. And I and the father are one, right? You've seen me, you've seen him. We're on the same page. We're doing the same thing. We have the same goal. We're here to take you back to heaven with us, to live with us forever. This is the end result of all this, which we're going to talk at the end of this Bible study, you know? And so we need to understand there is a bigger plane here. We can get very in, in particular about a problem and stare at it too closely and lose the big picture. Okay. Matthew 11, 28 through 30, come to me all who are, who labor and are heavily, heavily burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me for I'm gentle and humble in heart you, and you will find rest for your souls for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Right? And so here we have God it, through Jesus telling us like, listen, I know you're tired. I know you have all these burdens. I know the life we live in is tough. It's hard. He's saying, come to me. I will give you rest. And so God, Jesus is saying, and we know it represents God. I am gentle. I am humble. I will give you rest for your souls. Right? But you have to Stop the fighting, the struggle, right? In the problems that you have, you have to, you know, the Bible says, cast all your cares upon him. You have to learn to do that. It's hard to do because we so much want control. It says, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light, right? So there's not a, you're not absent of a yoke or you're not absent of a burden, but it's a manageable one. It's one that says like, listen, you can manage what I give you in this life to do for me and the rest I will take from you and do it myself. Okay. 
John 14, 13 through 20. And whatever you may ask in my name that I will do so that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask anything in my name, I will do it. If you love me, keep my commandments and I will pray the Father and he will shall give you another comforter so that he may be with you forever. So how do we receive this comfort? We have to love Jesus and God, obey them and in that, in that love and in that obedience. In other words, do it my way. I will give you the comforter, the Holy Spirit to come into your life and build you up, right? So what is our point of contact with God during our problems? It's the Holy Spirit. We have to be reaching out and, and in the spirit realm and in the spirit and understand this is where our comforts come from. This is the mechanism that God has given us here on this earth, right? Because we know the Shekinah glory of God is in heaven in the temple, that Jesus is in the temple serving God, right? That the Holy Spirit was the down payment, the earnest money in us, that we were the children of God, right? And that is our comfort, our, our understanding that, listen, what we're going through now is not life. This is just a momentary blip. We're going to get over it. It's not going to last forever. Think 10 years ago at the problems you dealt with 10 years ago. They're gone. You don't even deal with them anymore, right? But somehow we don't feel like 10 years from now, this problem is going to be gone because we're so close to it. We're so like, ah, you know, but we have to just tell ourselves this too shall pass. We will get through this. God is, that's what I do. God, you've always been faithful. You always provide us. You always helped us. You always give us away. We've had to make sacrifices. We had to go different paths, but you ultimately here we stand in your grace and your mercy. Right. And so that's what we need to look at our problems is that like, Hey, in the power of the Holy spirit, I can stand with God in this and make it through it one way or the other. We're making it to the other side. Okay. So the spirit of truth and the world cannot receive because it does not see him or know him, but you know him for he dwells with you and he shall be in you. I will not leave you orphans. I will come to you. In other words, you're not going to be left alone in this planet. If you're ever feeling like you're left alone in your problems, that's the devil. That is 100% the devil, right? That's the devil playing with the mind and, and manipulating the flesh because you have to coach yourself up. I am not alone. God is with me. I am the temple of God. The holy angels surround me, right? I am a light in this world. I am a salt in this world, right? Build yourself up and claim these things about yourself because that is who you are, right? And the devil wants you to think you're alone. Nobody cares. The problem will never end. You'll never find a solution. And that's where depression comes in, mm -hmm. right? So yeah, a little while and the worlds do not see me anymore, but you see me because I live. You shall also live. At that day, you shall know that I am in my Father, and you and me, and I and you. He's talking about the end of time, which we're going to talk about, okay? And that's where our focus needs to be, our final destination, mm -hmm. right? Imagine going on a, a walk around the lake, and the, at the end of the lake, there's a beautiful gazebo, there's a water fountain, there's drinks and refreshments and everything. But on the way, on, on, on your walk, you get tired on the pathway, and you get mad because the concrete isn't flat, and you stare at the crack in the concrete. What? point is that there's no point in it because at the end if you could just get over that bump and keep walking you're going to make it to the gazebo with the refreshments and friends and water fountains right that's heaven and so but in life we could do that we could stare at our problems too closely right and god was like don't stare at your problems he said cast all your cares upon me right and so we're that's what we need to do we need to cast okay so focus on the truth of his comfort. Second Corinthians one, three through six is that blessed be the God and father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the father of mercies and God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our afflictions. Are we comforted by God in all of our afflictions? Yes, we are. Sometimes we don't even realize it. We don't experience it. We don't understand it. But there is comfort happening. Right. And like people say, well, the problems can always be worse. True story. Problems can always get worse. They can get better. They can get worse. They can remain the same. But ultimately, we are not alone in whatever we're dealing with. Right. That we may be able to comfort those who are in any affliction through the comfort with which we ourselves have been comforted by God. Right. We talked about that in our endurance one that sometimes we go through things so God can use us to help other people who are going through those things. Right. For as the suffering of Christ abounds to us, even so our comfort also abounds to Christ. But if we are afflicted, it is for your comfort and salvation. If we are comforted, it is for your comfort, which produces you the patient enduring of the same sufferings which we also suffer. Right? So do we all suffer? We all suffer. Do we all have problems? We all have problems. There's no such thing as a problem-free life. But how we interact 
How we see those problems, how we understand those problems, what we think those problems mean determines the outcome of what we're doing with ourselves, right? And so, like, we're facing problems, you know, issues in my house right now, but I just give it to the Lord. I'm like, Father, it's yours. I don't know how to work it out. There's nothing I can do in my power. If there's something I need to do, tell me what to do. I'll do that. But ultimately, God, it's yours. I mean, what else can I do? Right? Lamentations 3, 22 through 26. It is because of Yahweh's loving kindness that we are not consumed because his compassion doesn't fail. So that's failures, that's sin, that's anything that separates from you God, from God, uh, your, your, your problems, self-created problems, anything. But his, this says Yahweh's loving kindness that we are not consumed because his compassion doesn't fail. In other words, you can always count on the loving, caring, compassionate God who wants to kiss your boo-boos and bandage your wounds and give you a hug and a pat on the head and be like, listen, we're going to make it. You're going to be fine. Just trust me. Trust me, trust me, trust me. Last night, my son woke up and his nose was so dry, he wound up getting a nosebleed, which I got a lot as a kid. And he was scared at first, but I just coached him. I'm like, you're okay. It's not a problem. You're going to be fine. And as you could see his tension and fear start to come down. Dad and mom weren't freaking out. He took a look around. He's like, okay, I'm going to be okay. His nose was still bleeding, you know? And by the time of it, he was being a little pro and all that, all that in him and just fear and not knowing what's going on left him right because he trusted the parents around him that what they were saying is absolutely true that he was going to be okay they were there to help and that he was a good boy right and so this is what we have to do with our god when our problems get so big we have to understand it's not as big as we feel it is it's not as big of a problem as we might project it to be right because if god holds all things together and he's gotten us through all of our other problems why are we worshiping the problem like we look at it like oh you know it's like it will never get around it no you know what five years from now a year from now you won't even be thinking about the problem you had today right but somehow because the devil just beats on us and we have a need for control and it's hard to let go of that control you know and we want to know the outcome one of the thing i hear from everybody i don't understand well let, get comfortable with not understanding when you're following Following the Lord, you're not always going to understand. And guess what? You don't need to understand to trust him. Because at what point is it trust if you have to understand everything? It's not. Trust is not knowing and, and saying, okay, I don't understand this. Joseph, you know, when he's tossed in the pit and sold into slavery. And, you know, how do you think that's a big, awesome plan, God? I, I would have been like, God, you're out of your mind. What are you thinking? Right. But God saw the end from the beginning and understood the final destination and the benefit it would produce in Joseph, you know, humble him one, you know, from all the blessings he received, but also the plan in his life. So when we look at it, I don't have to understand. I need to trust. Nowhere in the Bible says you have to under, understand everything from God, then you can believe him. That's not faith, is it? No, it's not faith. It's not trust. It's anything. All you're trying to do is level yourself up with God. Like, well, God, I'll submit once we're in agreement and you have my permission. You know, but that's not what he's saying. It's like, no, listen, I brought you into this life. I hold all things together. I'm in you. I'm around you. I'm protecting you in ways you don't know. Guess what? Just trust me. There are new uh, every morning. His compassions. Great is your faithfulness. Yahweh is my portion, says my soul. Therefore, I will hope in him. Yahweh is good to those who wait for him. Ah, there's the kicker. It's hard to wait to the soul who seeks him. Right. It is good that a man should hope and quietly wait for the salvation of Yahweh. So if it's in your sin, your rebellion, your problems, your issues, be patient with God, wait on him. I was telling God this morning, praying with my boys, God, I know it makes you happy when I have faith. I know it makes you happy when I trust you. I know it puts a smile on your face that I can sit here with you in my heart and, and worship you. Right. Praise God. Not knowing the outcome, because that motivates God. Yeah. That puts out something in him. Cause it's like when you're a kid, you know, trust like, Oh, my dad can do it. My, my dad's capable or my dad will protect me. Your dad's strong enough. Oh, yeah. I mean, I'm like, mm, yes, I am son. <laughs> you know, it gets you all bucked up and you're like, yeah, I could do this. God is there's no different. Why do you think we're this way? Because we're made like him. Right. But if you're sitting here doubting him the entire time, what do you think that does to him? What you don't, I haven't done enough for you. I gave you my son. I've kept you alive all this time. I fixed all your other problems. Is that good enough? Right. I mean, at what point did I fail? Right. How do you think that would make him feel? I refuse to be that way. You know, we see that with the Israelites, 
you know, where they're just doubting God. I, I, we should go back to Egypt, forget all this, you know. And so we don't want to be that way with God. We want to figure out, how God, how can I put a smile on your face? How can I make you feel proud? How can I put warmth in your heart about the way my family, me, deal with you, right? And, and, and exalt you and lift you up and just see what you will do for us. Mm-hmm. Psalms 23, 1 through 6, right? Yahweh is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside the still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his namesake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table for me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup runs over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. And I shall dwell in the house of Jehovah forever, or Yahweh, or the Lord, or however you want to say it. But either way, God. Right? And so we have a a podcast online that goes through that and what that means. But basically it means this. You are never alone. That's basically it. You want to just, you're never alone. You might go through the valley of the shadow of death and your enemy may surround you, right? But God is still leading you down that path, right? You might have all these things to happen. If you have to be made to lie down, you know, by cool streams and and green pastures, that means you weren't. That means you were brought there. Right. And so on this path with God, we just need to remember that, hey, he's faithful. He's going to do it. And he, he is there participating in your life. OK. Top page three. Trust that God sees you. This is so important. Matthew 10, 29 through 31. Aren't uh, Matthew 10, 29 through 31. Aren't two sparrows sold for a penny? Yet not one of them falls to the ground apart from your father's will. Even all the hairs on your head are numbered, so do not be afraid. You are more valuable than many sparrows. I always joke, you want God to think about you, pull out a hair, because he's counting them all, right? God, think about me, bing, you know, I wonder if he counts beard hair. But, uh, um, you know, but the point is, is like, if you know your kids, I know my kids really go, I don't know them that well. I've never sat down to count their hair. But God knows every single portion of you, every nook, cranny, everything about your being, your thoughts, your feelings, your emotion, every private secret thought you've ever had god knows these things right and so there's nothing you can hide from him he knows you that well now let me ask you something if you save up like we have uh, people in our group that just bought something they really wanted for a long time you save up for that money and and you finally get to the point where you okay now we can afford this nice thing right and like i have a guitar over here that back in the day i really wanted and i was finally able to purchase you know and so like if i get that guitar how quickly am I just to throw it away? Oh, you had a problem. Oh, it's a, look, with the car. You have a flat tire. Oh, you, you broke a string. Just throw it away. No, you paid such a high price. The, the, the death of your son, Jesus Christ, you know, to bring that back to yourself. You're not just going to be like, bing, first problem. No, right? You're, they're too valuable to you. Same thing with God and you, right? God loves you so much. He paid such a high price. He sees you. He understands you. He knows you. He's, there's nothing to be hidden, you know? And so I just refuse that personal self talk where, like, like, woe is me. Where are you, God? I'll never say, where are you, God? I know exactly where he is. He's on this throne, right? And I refuse to act that way before him because I know something now. I might be like, God, I'm totally confused. This makes no sense to me. Or, yeah, I wish I would do it differently. You know, it, this type of stuff, that's honest talk. But I will never doubt who he is, where he's at, and what he's doing. Mm-hmm. Because there's nothing good that comes of that. Because I know it's not true. And I'm trying to besmirch his character and say he's something he's not. You think that make God happy? No, that does not make God happy happy. Yeah, again, let's build them up. Let's say, God, I trust you. I have faith in you. I will do your will. I'll listen to you. Build him up. Okay. Psalms 139, 1 through 18. Yahweh, you have searched me and you know me. You know my sitting down and my rising up. You perceive my thoughts from afar. You search out my path and my lying down and are acquainted with all my ways. For there is not a word on my tongue, but behold, Yahweh, you know it all together. You hem me in and behind and before. You laid your hand on me. This knowledge is beyond me. It's lofty. I can't attain it. Where could I go from your spirit or where could I flee from your presence? If I ascend up into heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in shale, behold, you are there. If I take the wings of the dawn and settle in the utmost parts of the sea, even though your hand will lead me and your right hand will hold me. If I say, surely the darkness will uh, overwhelm me, the light around me will be night. Even the darkness doesn't hide from you, but the night shines as the day and the darkness is like to you, light to you. For you formed my innermost being. You knit me together, my mom. 
mother's womb. I will give thanks to you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful. My soul, soul knows them very well. My frame wasn't hidden from you when I was made in secret, woven together in the depths of the earth. Your eyes saw my body. In your book, they were all written the days that were ordained for me, when as yet there were none of them. How precious to me are your thoughts, O God! How vast is the sum! If I could count them, they are more number than the sand. When I wake up, I am still with you. Praise God. This is such a beautiful, like, I mean, read that every day. If you want to know how much God loves you, read Psalms 139, 1 through 18 every single day, you know, and just pour that into your soul that God is with you. He hasn't left you. He sees you and all your fears, all your concerns, all your worries, all your burdens, everything you're dealing with. You know, he just is so much a part of your life that he has not left you alone. OK, Romans 8, 16 through 18. The Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are the children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. If indeed we suffer with him, that we may also be glorified with him. For I consider that the suffering of the present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory in which will be revealed towards us. Right. What is he saying there? Listen, you guys are children of God. He's intimate in your life. He sees you. He has made you part of the family. And he says, listen, there's tough times. We all have tough times. It's right there. If we suffer, if we're willing to go through this life and, and have tribulation suffering, listen, we have a, a permanent part in what is to come. And that's where we need to keep our focus. Don't look at the sidewalk. Look at the destination, right? You know how they say when farmers drive and, and plow their fields, that if they look at their field while they're plowing, they make squiggly lines. There's no way to get it. But if they look out in the distance and see a post and keep their eye on that post and keep it in their mirror and they're, they're lined up with their, you know, their steering wheel and keep it right in line, they'll make a straight line, Right. And same thing, you're like mowing your yard. You have to have a point of reference. <laughs> right, Angel saying, yeah. And so like, that's what we have to do. We have to keep our eyes focused, not on that blip or the bump in the road or the problem or the issue, but long term, right? Romans 8, 33 through 39. Who could bring a charge against God's chosen ones? That's us, guys. Mm -hmm. It is God who justifies who is he who condemns? It is Christ who died, yes, rather, who was raised from the dead, who is at the right hand of God, who also makes intercession for us. Praise God. Mm -hmm. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Could oppression or anguish or persecution or famine, nakedness, peril, or sword? Do Christians go through those things, guys? Mm -hmm. They sure do. Sure. Right? But he's saying, even in all those things, you are not alone. Even as it is written, for your sake, we are all killed all day long. We are counted as sheep for the slaughter. No, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I'm persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor things present, nor things come, nor powers, nor heights, nor depths, nor any other created thing will be able to separate us from God's love, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. So is there any of these things that can separate any problems, any issues, any things in your life that can separate us from God? Absolutely not. Okay. Top page four. When you feel overwhelmed, right? First Peter five, six through 11. And God will exalt you in due time. If you humble yourself under his mighty hand by casting all your cares on him, because he cares for you. Right? So all these problems, every time it feels like we're getting overwhelmed and I have those moments where my brain's like trying to figure out too much. And it's just like, ah, you know, and you're just like, I give it to you, Lord. I can't, you know, what do I do? You know, be sober and alert. Your enemy, the devil just like a roaring lion is on a prowl looking for someone to devour. In other words, he, how is he, we can apply some things here. Cast all your cares. The devil's looking to apply. We can put those together. The devil is trying to devour with problems, concerns, worries, to beat your faith down, to break your trust in God, right? And to burden you so much that you crumble under his pressure and his attack. Right. And so like I am very acquainted with this pressure. You know, I live in it every single day, you know, and it, a day does not go by. I can barely remember a time that like lately that there has been a million things up in the air and I just you just have to go. God, I give it to you. I don't know what to do. You know, you love me more than I love me. You love my family more than I love my family. You love my my mom and my friends and, and stuff and brother, sister, Christ more than I love them. You know, and so if we're convinced that God loves them more and we love them because his love's in us, he's more concerned about it than you are. I promise you that. It doesn't seem like it at times because he's being gracious and patient with people, but he's more concerned about, about it than you are. Right. Resist him strong in your faith. So here we go. Don't let all those problems and, and stuff, burdens break your faith. 
because you know that your brothers and sisters throughout the world are enduring the same kind of sufferings. You're not alone. All who live godly will suffer persecution and have tribulations, what the Bible says. And now after you suffered for a little while, the God of your grace uh, God of all grace, who called you to his eternal glory in Christ, will himself re restore, confirm, strengthen, and establish you. To him belongs the power forever. Amen. So, in other words, endure. Don't quit. Don't come this far. It's like, Lance, you've gone five years in the ministry of trusting the Lord every way. Let's quit now. That's the dumbest thing. What was the point of doing it at all? If you're going to come five years into something and walk away from it. You've done put in on the work. You done showed the commitment. Now that you've gotten this far, I'm done. You know, no, don't, no, no. You shouldn't have done it, right? Because Jesus gave the parable about building a house and determining costs and make sure you can do it. You know, if only a fool goes in and pays $100,000 for something and walks away and leaves it. We pay too much of a price for this now. It would be the, the stupidest thing. But a lot of people do that in their faith. They, they, they walk with God so far and then it gets too hard and they'd walk away. Why'd you walk at all? What about all those times and years and all those acts of sacrifice, everything you've done to get to this point? And the devil convinced you it's too hard now, I'm done. No, we, we, we don't do that. Cause it says God and Christ will restore, confirm, strengthen and establish you. If you don't give up, right? Don't give up. Psalms 55, 22, throw your burden upon the Lord and he will sustain you. He will never allow the godly to be shaken. It doesn't mean you won't have problems. He's like, listen, you will not fall. You will not fail. You will continue on. I will see to it. it doesn't mean there won't be sacrifices. You might not have to give up some things. Life might change a little bit, but guess what? You're going to be alive. You will survive. I am with you. Yeah, you're going to make it. <laughs> Romans 8, 28 to 30. We know that all things work together for good for those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose, right? So no matter what it is, if you're in, in allegiance with God and Christ, it's working some good. It might not seem good at the moment, but it's working the good. For whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brothers, whom he predestined, that's us, those who he also called, and he called those he also justified, whom he justified, those he also glorified. Right? So guess what, guys? It might not feel like it right now, but you're glorified, you're being glorified, and you're going to be glorified at the return of Christ. Right? So understand your personhood, your worth, how much Christ and God paid for you, what they see you as, how much they value you, you know, and how much they want you to be with them. OK, Psalms 59, 16 through 17. But I will sing of your strength. Yes, I will sing aloud of your loving kindness in the morning for you have been my high tower, a refuge in the day of my distress to you. My strength, I will sing praises for God is my high tower, the God of my mercy. Right. So where's our fortress? Where's our refuge? It's in Christ. It's in God. It's understanding how much he loves us, who we are in him, his plan for us and the ultimate goal of all of this. Psalms 9, 9 through 10. Yahweh will also be a high tower for the oppressed, a high tower in times of trouble. Those who know your name will put their trust in you. For you, Yahweh, have not forsaken those who seek you. Right? So for those with an honest, open heart who are trying to get to God, God is with you, guys. Don't fret. Don't give up. It might seem weird at times, but don't give up. Okay. God's comfort is your sure fortress, a fortress of his love. Right. Psalms 91, 1 through 16. He who dwells in the secret place of the Most High will rest in the shadow of the Almighty. I should have highlighted that. The shadow of the Almighty. I will say of Yahweh, he is my refuge. Highlighted. And my fortress, my God in whom I trust. For he will deliver you from the snare of the fowlers and from the deadly pestilence. He will cover you with his feathers under his wings. You will take refuge. His faithfulness is your shield and your rampart. Are we getting this imagery? Okay. You shall not be afraid of the terror by night, nor the arrow that flies by day, nor of the peasants that walks in the darkness, nor the destruction that wastes at noonday. A thousand may fall at your side and 10,000 at your right hand, but it shall not come near you. You will only look with your eyes and see the recompense of the wicked because you have made Yahweh your refuge and the most high your dwelling place. Top of page five.
No evil shall happen to you, neither shall any plague come near your dwelling. For he will put his angels in charge of you to guard you in all your ways. They will bear you up in their hands so that you don't dash your foot against the stone. You will tread on the lion and the cobra, or you'll trample the young lion and the serpent in the foot, because he has set his love on me. Therefore I will deliver him. I will set him on high, because he has known my name. He will call on me, and I will answer. I will be with him in trouble. I will deliver him and honor him. I will satisfy him with long life and show him my salvation so now that we're getting this idea this match or fortress fort Knox, you know military base get inside god it doesn't say you'll never have trouble it doesn't say you'll never need to be delivered no he says when these times come when this hurt comes when these problems arise run to me for safety lower uh, raise the drawbridge shut the windows stand at your post and weather the storm in me Right. And so when we weather the storm in God, we know that there might be high winds. We might see things with our own eyes. We might see our loved ones fail. We might see a lot of things that are disheartening. But ultimately, our soul, our spirit, our destiny and who we are in Christ is standing firm through it all. Right now, we know Christians die every day. We know people are being persecuted, but their heart, their soul, their spirit, who they are as a person is locked up in the fortress of God that can never be touched, never lost, never profaned, never altered. Okay. And they have nothing to be concerned about because the ultimate destination is being reached. So nobody said that, hey, life's easy. It's not. I told us at the very beginning, life's not easy, especially for those who live godly. But what's in here, God in me and my spirit, my inner man is untouchable. It's bulletproof. And the only way it can receive harm is if I allow it. If I choose to let the devil in, if I go against God's will, if I bring him in and the devil wants to beat up your head to get you to open those gates so he can come in and attack. And that's why we need to stand strong, keep those doors shut and go, no, I'm in the Lord. I'm in Christ. I know who I am. You know, and come what may, I'm perfectly fine. Right. And so we can't let our fears and worries get so great that we don't understand how much we are protected in the spiritual realm. And then our destiny is sure. Right. And so it's like they said, the war has been won, but the battle rages on. And that's what's happening now. The war has been won, but the battle rages on because Jesus isn't done yet. God isn't done yet. Psalms 46, 1 through 11. God is our refuge and strength, the very present help in trouble. Therefore, we won't be afraid. Though the earth changes, though the mountains are shaken to the hearts of the sea, though its waters roar and are troubled, though the mountains tremble with their swelling salah, there is a river, the streams of which make the city of God glad, the holy place of the tents of the Most High. God is within her. She shall not be moved. God will help her at dawn. The nations raged, the kingdoms were moved. He lifted his voice and the earth melted. Yahweh of armies is with us. The God of Jacob is our refuge, salah. Come, see Yahweh's work, what desolation he has made in the earth. He makes war cease to to the end of the earth. He breaks the bow and shatters the spear. He burns the chariots in the fire. But be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. Yahweh of armies is with us. The God of Jacob is our refuge. Salah, right? So here we had, be still, trust in the Lord, cast your cares upon him, wait upon him, be patient, understanding that he is actively working. We can get this idea that God is just up on his throne, snoozing, taking a nap while the world's melting down around us, and he's not listening. You don't find that in the Bible. Right before the destruction of the earth, God gets silent in the temple. There's 30 minutes of silence because he's about to do a dreadful act, his strange act, the Bible calls it, you know, where he comes out and he's going to pour out all this punishment upon the earth. Right. But other than that, God is actively participating. Jesus is running back and forth, talking with God on our behalf. The Holy Spirit is delivering messages and insight to us, you know, to don't think that the courts of heaven are up there playing tiddlywinks, twiddling their thumbs, floating on clouds, just doing nothing because it's not true. All the heaven hosts of heaven are at work for us. Every, everything up there is at work. All, you know, like if you get Elijah, you get Moses, I can guarantee you they're participating. They're at work. For us, <laughs> let that let that sink in. Praise God! <laughs> Get me choked up. We're not alone. Things are happening in a mighty, wonderful way. 
But we have to have confidence. The Bible says we're surrounded by a great cloud of witnesses, of testimony, of people that trusted God, and that the earth was not even worthy of their existence because they trusted God and they sought a heavenly home. That's who we need to be, right? So don't think there's not one participant in heaven right now not actively working for our blessing, our protection, our help, our, our, our needs being met, our wants and our desires, everything, all of heaven is participating. Okay. And we have to have confidence in that, that this is a full court press until the day of completion. God is going to be with us in all these things. And so I hope we get that understanding. So when the wicked seem to prosper while you, you suffer, one of the easiest tricks of the devil is to get us to convert, uh, covet the blessings of the wicked and those who prosper. Two things happen when this occurs. We're essentially destroying our current blessing by being discontent and also telling God what he has given us is not enough. We must resist this temptation, right? Because, and that's what these verses are because we're not the only ones to deal with this. The psalmist also dealt with this because sometimes we can look at the world as like they're doing nothing for God. They're rebelling against God. They're sinning against God. They have everything they want and no concerns in this life. Well, let's, let's see what the Bible says. Psalm 7, 3, 1 through 28. Surely God is good to Israel, to those who are pure in heart. But as for me, my feet were almost gone. My steps had nearly slipped, for I was envious of the arrogant. When I saw the prosperity of the wicked, for there are no struggles in their death, but their strength is firm. They are free from the burdens of men. Neither are they plagued like other men. Therefore, pride is like a chain around their neck. Violence covers them like a garment. Their eyes bulge with fat. Their minds pass the limits of conceit. They scoff and speak it with malice and arrogance. They threaten oppression. They have set their mouths in the heavens. Their tongue walks th through the earth. Therefore, their people to return to them, and they drink up waters of abundance. They say, how does God know? Is there knowledge in the Most High? Behold, these are wicked, being always at ease. They increase in riches. Surely I have cleansed my heart in vain and washed my, top of page 6, Hands and innocence. So you see what he's saying is like, listen, if they're prospering this, why, why have I sought the Lord? Why have I tried to do it his way when everybody around me is ex forgetting the Lord and I'm suffering? For all day long, I've been plagued and punished every morning. If I had said, I will speak thus, behold, I would have betrayed the generation of your children. When I tried to understand this, it was too painful for me. Until they entered God's sanctuary and considered their latter end. What happens to those wicked? Surely yet you set them in a slippery place. You throw them down to destruction. How they are suddenly destroyed. They are completely swept away with terror. As a dream when one wakes up, so Lord, when you awake, you will despair, despise their fantasies. For my soul was grieved and I was embittered in my heart. I was so senseless and ignorant. I was a brute beast before you. Nevertheless, I am continually with you. You have held my right hand. You will guide me with your counsel and afterwards receive me to your glory. Whom do I, whom do I have in heaven? There is no one on earth whom I desire besides you. My flesh and my heart fails, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. For behold, those who are far from you shall perish. You have destroyed all those who are unfaithful faithful to you, but it is good for me to come close to God. I have made the Lord Yahweh my refuge that I may tell all of your works. You see what happened? He's sitting there despairing over watching all these evil people get everything they want in life. But then he comes to his senses like I've been ignorant. I've been dumb. I've been stupid. How can I not see their end? <clears throat> the devil wants us to look at the present, the here and now. That's not how we survive. We don't survive our problems and our issues by just dwelling on the present. We see the future. And he says, it has been good for me. Because he's like, why have I got right with you, God? But he's like, wait a minute, I'm not being honest here. If I was being honest, God, you have never left me. You have walked with me through all these things. They have desired an easy life. I have desired you. And because I have desired you, God, I will be with you forever. And you have never left my side. What do you want in this life? The deceitfulness of riches and ease and excess or the God of the entire universe that are, is going to make you like him and be with him forever and allow you to inherit the entire earth? Or do you want 20 acres and a nice house and a car and some vacations? I mean, make up your mind. I want it all. I want the entire universe to be mine in my father's presence, right? And that's what we're getting. But if we get tore up by what's going on around us and see what other people get to do, man, get us on the wrong path. Psalm 62, one through 12. My soul rests in God alone. My salvation is from him. 
He alone is my rock and my salvation, my fortress. I will never be greatly shaken. How long will you assault, O oh man? Would all of you throw him down like a leaning wall like a tottering fence. They fully intend to throw him down from his lofty place. The delight in lies. They bless with their mouths, but they curse uh, inwardly. Salah. My soul wait in silence for God alone, for my expectation is from him. He alone is my rock and my salvation, my forges. I will not be shaken. With God, God is my salvation and my honor. The rock of my strength and my refuge is in God. Trust in him at all times, you people. Pour out your heart before him. God is our refuge from Salah. Surely men of low degree are just a breath and men of high degree are a lie in the balance they will go up they are together lighter than a breath don't trust in oppression it'll become vain and robbery if riches increase don't set your heart on them god has spoken once twice i have heard this that power belongs to god also to you lord belongs loving kindness for you reward every man according to his work right and so when we need to understand is that when all of our troubles come upon us and all of our concerns and all of our worries. And it looks like money fixes all those problems. It doesn't. God fixes all those problems. Right. People helping us don't fix those problems. God using people to help fix those problems. It all goes back to God. You know, and so God is the salvation. God is the source. God is our hope. God works through people. We're the body of Christ. That's what we're here to do. And that makes God happy. But ultimately, there's nothing good in Lance. There's nothing good in any of us other than the spirit of God. And because the spirit of God resides in us, we can be helpful to one another and sacrifice. And since we're ruled by that spirit, we are like Jesus. We do things that please the father, right? Ultimately, it's from God. So when we see the world prosper, don't worry. Don't fret. Don't be consumed with it, right? Be consumed with the fact that God is with me. I am not alone. You know, I remember watching Ariana when she was a little girl. I took her to the Chick-fil-A once, and there was this really high play thing, and there was a clear tube that went between two high perches. It's probably 10 feet in the air. She was so excited to get up in there. She ran across it the first time, but there was no other way to get down but to go back through that clear tube. And so she was like, I was like, <coughs> I told her, I was like, don't worry. You'll be all right. So she turns around and she starts walking slowly through this tube because you can see the ground. And she says, I'm okay. God is with me. I am okay. God is with me. I am okay. God is with me. And she said that to herself all the way across the tube. I'll be okay. I'm okay. God is with me. Wow. And she got across the tube. That's what we need to be telling. I'm okay. God is with me. I'm okay. God is with me. We're going to be all right. God is with me. He has never failed me. I've been gone through some things, but he's always got me through it. And I got the other side. I am okay. God is with me, right? The real prosperity and riches that matter. First Corinthians one, three through nine. Grace and peace be to you from God, our father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I always thank my God for you because of the grace of God that was given to you in Christ Jesus. For you were made rich in every way in him. Think about that. You... <laughs> We think of riches as material. God thinks of riches spiritually. The world thinks of riches of having things now. God thinks of riches of having things then. Where moth and rust and nothing can destroy and you can't consume it. It's yours forever. So when it says you're made rich in him in every way, it's mental, emotional, physical, spiritual. You're made rich in ways you can't even understand you're rich. You're that rich. You're richer than the richest person on the face of the planet. Devil knows this. But he knows that we see with our eyes the pride of life and lust of the flesh. And it's easy because we're easy to manipulate that because we focus on it and interact with it every day. And that's why it takes faith to think that I have riches in heaven I can't even comprehend right now. God has something in store for me I couldn't even like fathom, and, you know, in this body, in this frame. But it is coming my way. Right. And if we can build ourselves up that, listen, I have a heavenly home. I am filthy, stinking rich in all things that truly matter to God, my father. And I will have all these things forever in his presence. You can't get richer than that. Right. And so in all your speech and every kind of knowledge, just as the testimony about Christ has been confirmed among you so that you do not lack any spiritual gift as you wait for the revelation of our Lord Jesus Christ. A good spiritual gift. He will also strengthen you to the end so that you'll be blameless on the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. God is faithful by whom you were called into fellowship with his son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Right. The real prosperity when you see people have more than you or different, but just, you know, we live in the West. We think we sacrifice and you go to other countries that live in mud huts and they eat rice every day, three times a day or one time a day, every day of their lives. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and we think it's worth because we're eating peanut butter and jelly. They'd die for a peanut butter and jelly. Mm 
right? And so we have to understand some perspective on our lives and what we've gotten accustomed to, used to, and realize that's not really, we've been uh, pacified by our, our, uh, you know, prosperity, you know, and so we have to refocus on what God understands. How did Jesus live? Did he live in a palace? He said he had no place to home. Did he have all the food in the world? No, he went to the poor sides of fields that eat off the corners. You know, was he poor? No. Was he rich? Yes. Did he have all things? Yep. So prospective, right? So every time we get something nice, you know, like Angel made us coffee this morning. That's a delicacy. God doesn't have to give me coffee. You know, <clears throat> nowhere in scripture says your coffee will be sure. Just not there. He says your bread will be, you'll eat. But it doesn't have to be something so nice. So every time we get to have something like that, let's not look past our blessings. Our blessings are so much greater than the rest of the world in the West. It's ridiculous, right? And so a lot of it's perspective, and the devil manipulates our perspective and then gets us twisted, coveting other people's blessings, looking at the world and what they have. We look past all that we really truly have that most of the world doesn't have, right? Right. And even all the sacrifices of me and my family and stuff, we still have so much more than the rest of the world. There's Christians out there doing more for God than me and my family, sacrificing more for God than me and my family, and losing more than me and my family. So at what point do I go, God, why have you failed me? Yeah, it's not happening, you know? And so, but it's perspective, 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 right? And so we all need things, you know? But some of us need vehicles. I've needed a vehicle for five years. Still waiting, still praying for it. Hasn't come yet, you know. And so, you know, and there's other people in our group that need certain things. But guess what? God is faithful. His grace is sufficient. Be patient and wait. You know, we think five years, that's a long time to wait. No, not really. Not all eternity or 6,000 years. It's not that long. A day with the Lord is 1,000 years to us, you know. So to God, it's been what? Like half of like 10 minutes? I mean, it's like... Perspective. Okay. Find comfort in the grand plan. Okay. So this is where it kind of jumps off. Okay. This is a kind of a whole different section. Okay. But I wanted to include this so badly because we've been talking about the whole time of seeing the longevity of the situation, the long termness mm -hmm. of it. Okay. And I think this will help us reset our minds a little bit more and help us re-understand what's really going on. And so find comfort in the grand plan. Refocus on the long-term goal of God. We can sometimes feel like, what is the point of all this suffering, pressure, and pain? We need to widen our scope of view and see it as how God sees it. God has created a long-term plan from the very foundation of the universe that stretches the last great day. We consumed, if we are consumed with our day, year, or we can lose sight of the grand design and forget that we are on a journey to perpetual peace, joy, and happiness. So let's not get hung up on a bump in the road, but focus on the destination. It says, your salvation, peace, joy, and happiness has always been God's plan for you. Titus 1-2, in hope of eternal life, which God, who cannot lie, promised before time began. So before the very beginning of time, before it even started, God has promised and put in you eternal life, this goal, this plan, right? So before Adam and Eve, before anything, before the earth was uh, vo uh, void and without form, before he spoke, the goal was always eternal life. Yeah. Put that in your heart, put it in your mind, let you know that before you ever came to an existence, the goal was eternal life. It says, God has chosen you before he created the universe. Revelation 17, 8. The beast that you saw and was and is not, this is some prophecy, and is about to extend up out of the abyss into the uh, into perdition. And those dwelling on the earth will marvel with those whose names were not written in the book of life from the foundation of the world, right? Only those who are written in the book of life, this is me talking, are allowed into heaven. So they were written into the book of life at the very foundation of the world. And Titus 1, 2 says, before time even began, eternal life was the plan. So you were written down in that book. I'm going to make Lance. Eternal life, check mark. Angel, Sarah, Melissa, Cheryl, every, you know, everybody we know. That loves the Lord. Check mark. Check mark. That's the plan for your existence. Okay. I'll keep reading. Uh, who's not written the book from the foundation of the world when they behold the beast that was and yet is to come. Okay. And so this prophecy, but we want to focus on those whose names are not written in the book of life from the foundation of the world. You were written there before the earth was formed. Jesus is ready to die for you before creation ever happened. Revelation 13, 8. 
And all dwelling on the earth will worship it, and those whose names have not been written in the book of life of the land slain from the foundation of the world. Right? And so we have written in the book of life of the foundation of the world, eternal life was the plan before time began, and that Jesus died for you before the earth was ever formed. That was always the plan, that Jesus was going to die for you, that He, you were going to be purchased, you are going to be returned back to God, you are going to have eternal life, live in perpetual happiness, peace, and joy for the rest of all eternity that has always been the plan for your life Amen. now the bumps in the road are hard but I focus on the plan focus on what God's real goal was knowing who you are and wanting to be with you forever God and Jesus created the universe with the goal of your perpetual happiness in mind at this very point God and Jesus knew your entire life and all that you would you encounter and deal with all your successes and failures they still with a mighty outpouring of love planned for your per permanent future will, uh, future well-being life on this earth is not the destination it's just a layover for the eternal celestial kingdom this is just a bump in the road this is not it feels like so much because it seems like it lasts so long but it's nothing guys so with that in mind i wanted to read genesis 1 and 2 <clears throat> and i put a note please keep in mind they had you on their minds when they did the following okay so please keep in mind they had you on their minds when they did the following genesis 1 1 through 31. In the beginning, God created the heavens and earth. Day one. They were thinking about you. Now the earth was out shape and empty, and darkness was all over the surface of the watery deep. But the Spirit of God was moving over the surface of the water. God said, Let there be light. And there was light. God saw that the light was good, so God separated the light from the darkness. God called the light day and the darkness night. There was evening and there was morning, marking the first day. Second day, he was thinking about you. God said, let there be an expanse in the midst of the waters. Let it separate from the water. So God made the expanse and separated the water under the expanse from the water, which is above. And it was so. God called the expanse sky. There was evening and there was morning. That's the second day. Third day, God was thinking about you. God said, let the water under the sky be gathered to one place and let dry ground appear. It was so. God called the dry ground land and they gathered the waters uh, he called seas. God saw that it was good. God said, let the land produce vegetation, plant yielding seeds and trees on the land, bearing fruit with seed in it, according to their kinds. It was so. The land produced vegetation, plants yielding seeds, according to their kinds, and trees bearing fruit with seeds, according to their kinds. God saw that it was good. There was evening and there was morning the third day. The fourth day, God was thinking about you. God said, let there be light in the expanse of the sky to separate the day from the night and let them be signs to indicate the seasons and the days and the years and let them serve as lights in the expanse of the sky to give light on the earth. And it was so. God made two great lights, the greater light to rule over the day and the lesser light to rule over the night. He made the stars also. He placed the lights in the expanse of the sky to shine on the earth, to preside over the day and the night and to separate the light from the darkness. God saw that it was good. There was was evening and there was morning the fourth day the fifth day god was thinking about you god said let the water swarm with swarms of living creatures and let birds fly above the earth across the expanse of the sky god created the seas creatures and every living and moving thing with which water swarmed according to their kinds and every winged bird according to their kind god saw that it was good god blessed them and said be fruitful and multiply and fill the waters in the seas and let the birds multiply on the earth there was evening and there was morning a fifth day the sixth day, God was thinking about you. God said, let the land produce living creatures according to their cattle, creeping things and wild animals, each according to its kind. It was so. God made the wild animals according to their kind, the cattle according to their kind, and all the creatures that creep along the ground according to their kinds. God saw that it was good. And then God said, let us make humankind in our image after our likeness, so they may rule over the fish of the sea and the birds of the air, over the cattle and over all the earth, and over all the creatures that move on the earth. God created humankind in his own image, and the image of God he created them male and female he created them god blessed them and said to them be fruitful and top of page nine 
multiply, fill the earth and subdue it. Roll over the fish of the sea and the birds of the air and every creature that moves on the ground. Then God said, I now give you every seed bearing plant on the face of the entire earth and every tree that has fruit with seeds in it. This will be your fruit, uh, be yours for food. And to all the animals of the earth and to every bird of the air and to all the creatures that move on the ground, every thing that has breath of life in it. I give every green plant for food. And it was so. God saw the, the, all that he had made and it was very good. This was evening and this was the morning, the sixth day. The seventh day, God was more than just thinking about you at this point. At this point, he was celebrating it. So up to this point, I want you to think everything that God was, imagine that you, you're going to have a baby and you're making a nursery. You're painting walls, you're putting in cribs, you're putting the rocket cherry, you put the music, but you do it. This is what God was doing. He was like, I'm going to make a most beautiful place for them. Day six was the day the baby was born. Day seventh, he got to go home and sit in the nursery. Praise God. Thank you, Jesus. I hope you understand how much God was thinking about you. Praise the Lord. Seventh day, God was thinking about you. Genesis 2, 1 through 25. The heavens and the earth were completed with everything that was in them. But this uh, seventh day, God finished the work that he had been doing, and he ceased on the seventh day all the work that he had been doing. God blessed the seventh day and made it holy because on it he ceased all the work he had been doing in creation. This is the account of the heavens and earth when they were created, when the Lord God made the heavens and the earth and the heavens, right? And so we're going to keep reading. Life abounds. Now no shrub of the field had yet grown on the earth, and no plant of the field had yet sprouted, for the Lord God had not caused it to rain on the earth, and there was no man to cultivate the ground. Spring would well, uh, springs would well up from the earth and water the whole surface of the ground. The Lord God formed the man from the soil of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living being. And then the Garden of Eden, or pleasure. The Lord God planted an orchard in the east in Eden, where the, he placed the man and he had formed. The Lord God made all kinds of trees grow from the soil, every tree that was pleasing to uh, look at and good for food. Now the trees of the life and the trees of the knowledge of good and evil are in the midst of the orchard. Now a river flows from Eden to the... Uh, from Eden to water the orchard, and from there it divides into four head streams. The name of the first is Pishon. It runs through the entire land of Havilah, where there is gold. The gold of that land is pure. Pearls and uh, lapis lazuli are also there. The name of the second river is Gohan. It runs through the entire land of Cush. The name of the third river is Tigris. It also runs along the uh, east side of Assyria. The fourth river is Euphrates. The Lord God took the man and placed him in the orchard in the Eden to uh, care for it and to maintain it. Then the Lord God commanded the man, you may freely eat from every tree of the orchard, but you must not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, for when you eat it from it, you will surely die. Top of page 10. Fellowship in bloom, still in uh, Genesis 2, 18. The Lord God said, it is not good for man to be, lo be alone. I will make a companion for him who corresponds to him. The Lord God formed uh, uh, God, Lord God formed out of the ground every living animal of every field and every bird of the air. He brought them to the man to see that he would name them. And whatever the man called each living creature, that was its name. So the man named all the animals, the birds of the air, and the living creatures of the field. For, uh, for But for Adam, no companion who corresponded to him was found. So the Lord caused the man to fall into a deep sleep. And while he was asleep, he took part of the man's side and closed it up the uh, up the place with flesh. Then the Lord God made a woman from the part he had taken out of the man, and he brought him to the man. Then the man said, uh, this one at last is bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. This one will be called woman, for he was taken out of, uh, she was taken out of man. That is why a man leads his father and mother and unites with his wife and they become one, become a new family the man and his wife were both naked but they were not ashamed so it says as we know sin came into the world and created the painful existence we now live in this life is not the destination of our travels is that it can overwhelm us if we think of it as being the destination like the believers of old we must always remember that we are just passing through this life is a layover before we reach our final destination so before we move on god thought about you through all of creation the plan was your existence he was creating a place for you to reside a place that would sustain your life i can't go live on mars i would die god made everything on this planet to work in unison for my well-being 
right? That's why I said the heavens declare the glory of God. We can look at creation. It proves his existence, right? And so we can see the love of God and what he has made for us. Now it has fallen, but that's what we're getting to right now. But that was made for our well-being, right? That it's there to take care of us. So we are pilgrims, Hebrews eleven thirteen through 16. These all died in faith, not having received the promise, but have, having seen them and embraced them afar, having a confessed that we are strangers and pilgrims on this earth. For those who say such things make it clear that they are seeking a country of their own. If indeed they had been thinking of that country from which they went, they would have ha, would have had enough time to return. But now they desire a better country that is a heavenly one. Therefore, God is not ashamed of them to be called their God, for he has prepared a city for them. So with what much care that God, you know, has made the earth and Jesus has made the earth for us, right? Jesus said, Jesus said, behold, I go to prepare a place for you. Right? That's what's happening. I should have added the verse. And so Jesus goes back to heaven. He goes, listen, I am preparing for you yet another place. That one has sent, received harm. I will make it better. I'll make it, I'll make it so much better than it ever was. We're humanity got an upgrade because we will be like him, not just living in a garden. We'll get, we'll receive his spirit fully, walk in his presence, have immortality. Adam and Eve didn't have immortality. They had to not eat of the, uh, eat of the tree of life. We will receive immortality. You might be thinking, but God, let God let that happen. Yes, but he is giving us more. We are going to be a part of the family of God, heirs with Christ, receiving immortality, receiving the fullness of the spirit. And Jesus is actively participating in that, making us a new heavenly home, way better than what we had here. And this is pretty awesome. If we look at it without all the sin, what's coming is even more awesome. That's right. Okay, and that's what's happening. Okay, we will experience affliction on this layover. We are pilgrims. Acts 14, 22, strengthen in the souls of the disciples, exhorting them to continue in faith, and that through many afflictions we must enter into the king and God's kingdom, or the kingdom of God, right? So in this life, you'll have tribulation, you'll have persecutions, you'll have problems, but keep your eye on the destination. That's the key. Love God, love man, focus on where you're headed. You want to make it through it and you don't want to lose your path? Love God, love man. Keep your eyes on what God's making for you up there, okay? But just like Jesus, comfort your souls by looking to what is to come. Hebrews 12, 2. Looking to Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame and sat down at the right of the throne of God. So for the joy that was set before him, what's the key, guys? For the joy that is coming. Not that you always have joy here. Not that it's always easy. For the joy that is coming, focus on the goal. What God is making for you and giving you in heaven. So, roughly 6,000 years of pain and suffering will have passed. And this glorious day of renewal will come upon the chosen people of God and his creation. This is the joy that was set before Jesus as he walked the earth. This is the joy set before Jesus and God at the creation of the universe. This is our comfort and promise of the good that is to come our way. Okay? So when it says the joy that was set before Jesus, the book of Revelation, we read the first two chapters of Genesis. We're reading the last two chap uh, last couple chapters of the book of Revelation. So we can get the whole picture. Okay, guys, all things made new. Revelation 21, 1 through 27. I saw a new heaven and a new earth for their first heaven and the first earth, first earth has passed away and the sea is no more. I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of the earth, heaven from God, prepared like a bride adorned for her husband. I heard a loud voice out of heaven saying, behold, God's dwelling is with his people. And he will dwell with them and they will be his people and God himself will be with them as their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes. Death will be no more. Neither will be mourning nor crying nor pain anymore. Praise God. That is our destination. That's what God has planned for us. We will never hurt. We'll never cry out of pain. We'll never feel this shame or guilt or, or any of these things we lack here on the earth. It will be happiness forever. Can your mind even wrap your wrap around the concept of not being tired, always being feeling well, always being uh, full of energy, always laughing, always being full of happiness and joy. I mean, it makes my heart swell just thinking of the possibility of it, you know, and I want it so badly, but we have to understand we're in a journey to get there. Okay. 
The first things have passed away. He who sits on their souls, behold, I am making all things new. Right? For these words of God are faithful and true, guys. This is our destination. This is where we're headed. This is what we're receiving. This is the goal. This life and all of its pleasures and everything we see people doing is nothing. It burns. It doesn't matter to God. God is like, I'm giving you something a hundred million times better than that, guys. Understand my understanding of it is what he's saying. Look through my eyes. Reason through my reasoning. Free gifts for the overcomers. He said that I am the alpha and the omega, the beginning and the end. I will give freely to him who is thirsty from the springs of the water of life. He who overcomes, I will give him these things. I'll be his God and he will be my son, sons or daughters. But for the out cowardly, the unbelievers, sinners, abominables, murderers, sex or immoral, sorcerers, idolaters and all liars. Their part is in the lake of fire that burns with fire and sulfur, which is the second death. So all those people that seem like they're getting away with it, hurting people, living their lives up and rejecting God to get this life's goods. He's saying, listen, what we read in the book of Psalms, we know their end. We know what becomes of them. They disappear. They don't They cease to exist. Right. And those people that hurt and harm us and uh, shame us in this life, they're gone. OK, we'll never have to deal with that again. So the eternal city, verse nine, one of the seven angels who had seven bowls who loaded with seven last plagues, And he spoke with them, saying, come here, I will show you the wife, the lamb's bride. He carried me away in the spirit to a great high mountain. And he showed me the holy city, Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, having the glory of God. Her light was like a most precious stone, as if it were jasper stone, clear as crystal. Having a great and high wall, having twelve gates at the uh, gates, twelve angels, and names written on them, which are the names of the twelve tribes of the children of Israel. On the east were three gates, and on the north three gates, and on the south three gates, on the west three gates. The walls of the city had twelve foundations. On them were the twelve names of the twelve apostles of the Lamb. He who spoke with me ha had for a measure a golden reed to measure the city, its gates, and its walls. The city is square, and its length is. As it's great as it's width. His uh, measured this uh, city with the reed, 12,012 12 stadia. Its length, width, and height are equal. Its walls is 140 cubits by the measure of a man that is of an angel. The construction of it uh, of its walls was jasper. The city was pure gold like pure glass. The foundation of the city's walls were adorned with all kinds of precious stones. The first foundation was jasper. The second sapphire. The third uh, Calsardonites, the fourth emeralds, the fifth uh, sardonyx, the sixth sardis, the seventh chrysolite, the eighth beryl, the ninth topaz, the tenth chrysoprius, the eleventh jacent, and the twelfth amethyst. The twelve gates were twelve pearls. Each of the twelve gates were made of one pearl. The city of the streets were of pure gold like transparent glass. The eternal light of God, verse 22. I saw no temple in it. And for the Lord God, the Almighty and the Lamb are its temple. The, the city has no need for the sun, neither the moon to shine, for the very glory of God illuminated it. And its lamb is the uh, lamp is the lamb. The nation uh, will walk in its light. The kings of the earth bring the glory and the honor of the nations into it. Its gates will in no way be shut by day, for there will be no night there. And they shall bring the glory and the honor of the nations into it so that they may enter. They will in no way enter in anything that profanes or causes an abomination or lie, but only those who are written in the Lamb's book of life. Praise God. No more pain. The river of eternal life. Revelation 22, 1 through 5. He showed me a river of water of life, clear, uh, clear as crystal, proceeding out of the throne of God and of the Lamb. And in the midst of its streets on the side of the river, and on this was a tree of life bearing 12 kinds of fruits, yielding its fruits every month. The leaves of the trees were uh, for the healing of the nations. There uh, there will be no curse anymore. The throne of God and the Lamb will be in it, and his servants will serve him. They will see his face, and his name will be on their foreheads. There will be no night there. There will be no uh, lamp light uh, no need uh, sorry and they need no lamp light for the lord god will illuminate them they will reign forever and ever amen praise god that's our eternal destination no more pain no more suffering beautiful we know a new heavens and a new earth this earth we're on that people try to dominate is yours it's mine it belongs to us Okay, God is going to burn it with fervent heat and make it new again and burn away all the impurities and make something beautiful once more that will never be corrupted. And you will have ownership of it for all eternity. Okay, 
So together forever, happiness without end. Amen. First Thessalonians 4, 16 through 18. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel and with the trump, trumpet. The dead in Christ will rise first, and those who are alive and who are left will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. So we will be with the Lord forever. Therefore, comfort one another with these words. So we will be with the Lord forever. And so, I mean, guys, just think of that permanent happiness, no pain, no suffering, no sin, no ability to sin. You have no desire of it. You won't have any struggles, just happiness all the time. I mean, and that's what God wants to give you. But he's like, listen, you have to give up this life. You have to give up the things of this world that distract you from me. Walk with me. I will bless you with good things. Don't think he won't bless you. He will bless you. But that's not the purpose. That's not the focus. The focus is our destination. If we are traveling as pilgrims upon this earth and upon this path, then don't give up. Keep moving forward. Don't stop. No matter how bad you hurt, no matter how bad you're scared, no matter the problems you see, no matter the mountain before you, you can't get around in your mind. Don't worry. Look to the destination. Just like when you're out in the outback or in the mountains and stuff and you're traveling, if you never want to get lost, you look off to a distance to a high peak or valley or something you can always see and you walk that direction. And so you might swerve to the left a little, swerve to the right a little, but your end destination will always be the same. Okay? So key tips to walk with God in comfort as we close out. Stay in the word of God, Romans 15, 4 through 5. For whatever things were written before were written for our learning, that through perseverance and through encouragement of the scriptures, we might have hope. How do you guys get hope? It's through the word of God. You have to read the Bible. You have to be in God's word. You have to focus on these things. This is how the Bible tells you to have hope. Now, the God of perseverance and of encouragement grant you to be the same mind with one another according to Christ Jesus. A day without scripture is a day without hope. I'll just say that right now. A day without the word of God is a day without the, the source and the power that brings you joy, peace, health, healing, confidence, and hope. Okay? You have to have it every single day. Top of page 13. It says, refocus your thoughts, Philippians 4, 6 through 9. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your request be made known to God. And the peace of God, which passes all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus, right? And so he gives us a recipe. He said, focus on the God's going to renew you. He's going to answer your prayers. The peace of God, which surpasses all understanding. In other words, you don't know why you're at peace. It's just that you are. But then he gives us a recipe, guys. Right. How not to fight against that peace that God gives. It says, finally, brethren, whatever things are true, whatever things are honest, whatever things are right, whatever things are pure, whatever things are lovely, whatever are good report. If there is any virtue, if there's any praise, think on these things. These things do not fight against the peace of God. If you think on what's true, honest, right, pure, lovely, of good report, of virtue and are praiseworthy then what your mind is working on will not fight against the peace of God. You will not poison your own well. Okay? And so we don't want to poison our, our own well, what they call stinking thinking. We don't want to poison ourselves and dilute our own authority and power in Christ by allowing the devil to fill our hearts and minds with bad soils. Right. Okay? Do those things which you have also learned and received and heard and seen in me, and God of peace will be with you. In other words, obey, listen, focus. Okay, decide this day to rejoice and remain in the joy of the Lord. Nehemiah 8, 9 through 12. Nehemiah, who was the governor of Ezra, and the priests and the scribes and the Levites who taught the people, said to all the people, Today is holy to Yahweh your God. Don't mourn nor weep. For all the people wept that they heard the words of the law. Then he said to them, Go your way, eat the fat. Drink the sweet, which is wine, and send portions to him for whom has nothing is prepared. For day, today is holy to our Lord. Don't be grieved, for the joy of Yahweh is your strength. So the Levites calmed all the people saying, hold your peace, for the day is holy. Don't be grieved. Self-control, people. All the people went their way to eat, to drink, and to send portions to celebrate because they had understood the words that were declared to them. Right? So for the joy of Yahweh is your strength. In other words, we have to make choices every day to choose happiness, choose joy, choose peace. Like I've said a million times, if you can't be happy today, you won't be happy tomorrow. That's right. 
It just doesn't work. Start today. It doesn't mean like there's people that go in some horrific things, like they have injured kids in hospitals about to die. It doesn't mean God expects you to walk around with a smile on your face about that. But you can have peace that God has a plan. You can have hope that there's an outcome that's worthy of his name, that God has not forgotten you. You don't have to be running around like you're just the world is falling down on you and the sky is exploding, right? God does not want that from us, right? Jesus in the garden trusted God explained he still cried. Right. I'm not saying tears are wrong, right? I'm saying that, listen, in that tears, in that grief, in that pain, in that hurt, have hope, have some peace. God understands that where there's two of us, there's a physical and there's a spiritual side. I fight my flesh all the time because it wants me to submit to it and make me not do ministry, submit to it and make me so tired and burn out. I can't do anything. And I tell it, no, I will do it and I will keep telling it no and I'll keep doing what the God tells me to do regardless of how I'm feeling. Right. And because guess what, guys, there's two battles here. And sometimes the flesh cries out, even though the spirit is strong, you know, and we understand there is a battle. So I don't want to put this rosy colored thing that people just lost, lost a very important loved one and they're not allowed to cry. I'm not saying that I'm saying in those tears, in that grief, have joy, have peace that God has a plan. Have hope in your heart. God understands the separation. He understands the loss. But in, in all that, our foundation is hope, peace, and joy in Christ Jesus. That there's something to come. So people can lose a loved one, but still have joy and hope of what is to come. You still can cry and still have peace. That's right. right? You can still say, God, I don't understand, but I trust you. Right. So people are like, well, Lance, you're being no, I'm just being honest that despite what we're feeling in our emotions, I can tell my kids, your emotions aren't wrong. The way you think about feel about things is not wrong. It's what you do with it. Either Satan will use it to cripple you and smash you down to the earth and get rid of all that joy, peace and hope you have in your heart. Put there by God through the power of the Holy Spirit, your comforter. Or you could say, yes, I can feel my my compassion for a loved one who's hurting. And be very concerned about that. But I still can have peace in my heart. I could still have joy. Right? And so I they they, they can't that I don't have to like fall off the wagon of my hope, fall off the wagon of my faith. Right? I can look at life and go, This is tough, this is hard, I'll cry with you, I'll pray with you. But guess what? Who I am, my foundation is peace, hope, and joy and faith in Christ Jesus and God and his plan, okay? So trust that God sees you. He saw you before the earth was even created. When he made the Garden of Eden, it was like making a nursery for you and for your four parents to raise you up and to protect you and to give you a good life. That Jesus came and died to give you that good life once more. He's up in heaven making a heaven for you. And he's going to come back and say, okay, guys, it's time to go. We got something good up here. Let's go do it. We're done. But I want you to know, as we pass through this life, God and Jesus aren't finished. The, the, the completion of the plan it hasn't happened yet. The devil still runs around on this earth. There's still sin. There's still death. They're putting an end to it. Don't be consumed by looking at it. Look at your father. Look at heaven. Look at the plan. Look what he's giving you. Look at how much he loves you. Look how he's count your hair. Look how he's gotten you through this life. Dwell and think about those things. And then you will make it. You will make the journey. Don't fall off the narrow path. The devil wants you off the narrow path. Focus on the narrow path. Don't fall off the narrow path. Don't let this devil get you on the wide path that leads to destruction. Okay? And 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 don't think it's easier. It's not. They hurt just as much as you do. They have much loss as you do, but they have no hope. It's worse for them. And that's why you see them running from one thing to the next to try to numb that pain they feel that ha they have no answer for. Right. right? But we have the answers to help understand why life is hard, to help understand why people suffer, to understand the grand design and the plan of it. God loves us. He's comforting us. He has a plan. So don't give up and be at peace. Okay? As much as you can. Just keep pushing forward and keep a smile on your face. Dear and Father, we praise you. We thank you that you love us so much. Even at the very beginning, it's always been your plan for us to live forever with you, to have eternal life with you, to, to, for you to give us heaven, to be like you, to have immortality, to rule the entire universe with you, to like this planet our, our own. And so we just glorify you this in, in this, Father. We just thank you so much, Father. I just rebuke despair. I rebuke depression. I rebuke pain and suffering out of us all, Father. We accept your 
joy of the Lord, the peace that passes understanding. We will refocus our hearts, refocus our minds. And at times when we cry, we're not going to feel shame for crying. Lord, you give us compassion. We care for people. It's okay to cry. And it's okay to feel down about things, Father, but we'll never lose our hope again. We'll never lose our faith. We'll never lose our trust, Father. We can look at the problems honestly, but say, my God has a plan. I'm okay. God is with me. And we love you so much. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Praise God. If you feel so led of the Lord and want to know how to donate to this ministry outreach, please visit boyrants.com and scroll down the bottom of the name page for a PayPal link. Thank you because boy is the one to point on boyrants.com. BrotherLamps.com